Welcome back, nerdlings. Today we're going to be discussing the mitochondria and chloroplasts. Let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to be discussing the structure and the function of both mitochondria and chloroplasts. Then I'm going to kind of delve into the endosymbiotic theory. So as far as structure is concerned, the mitochondria has two membranes. It has a smooth outer membrane, and then it has a very highly folded inner membrane, as you see here. This is called cristae, and this is actually the site of the electron transport chain. So these membranes right here that I'm tracing along with my little cursor, this is going to be where the electron transport chain is located, and that's also going to synthesize ATP, which as you know, is the energy molecule, and that is why everything can basically happen in our body. That's how we provide energy to fuel all of life's processes. So this fluid-filled space right here that's between the two membranes is called the mitochondrial matrix, and this is the site of the Krebs cycle. So as far as the function, the mitochondria serves as the site for cellular respiration. So I'm sure that you've all heard the fact that the mitochondria, this little guy right here, is the powerhouse of the cell. And the reason that you get that generic terminology is because it is truly what fuels our body. So again, since it is the site of cellular respiration, that whole process is so we can generate ATP to be able to fuel all of the different reactions that take place in our body. So through this process, the mitochondria breaks down carbohydrates, lipids, and other molecules. Now they do this through a process called catabolism. And if you remember, previous lectures, we talked about catabolic and anabolic reactions using the processes of hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis, respectively. So if you remember, cats, they scratch things apart. And in this case, they're going to be breaking the bonds of larger macromolecules through the process of hydrolysis. Hydro meaning water, and lysis, hachap, meaning to split. And that is referred to as catabolism, breaking apart. So this process is going to break those larger macromolecules apart. So next up, we have this being called aerobic respiration. Now the reason we call it aerobic respiration is because this process requires oxygen. So mitochondria are adapted for their role in cellular metabolism and also possess structural remnants of their endosymbiotic origin. And we're going to get into that at the end of this lecture. So next up is our chloroplast. Now similar to the mitochondria, it is composed of two membranes. We again have a smooth outer membrane, and then the inner membrane is actually arranged into sacs that are called thylakoids. The sacs of the thylakoids are called grana. And then we have stroma, which is actually the internal fluid filled space between the outer and the inner membrane. And if I wanted to cut one of these little guys open, the space inside those thylakoids is called the lumen. So as far as the function, this is the site of photosynthesis. So we have light-dependent reactions that take place in the thylakoid, and we have light-independent reactions that take place in the stroma, which is that fluid-filled space. So this is carbon fixation, and it's referred to also as the Calvin cycle. So lots of different words to describe the same processes. It makes glucose from light energy and water, and this is considered an anabolic process. So cellular respiration is a catabolic process because we are breaking macromolecules apart. Whereas conversely, photosynthesis, photo meaning light, and synthesis, putting different molecules together, is going to build. So photosynthesis is an anabolic reaction, so ana, Adds, and it is adding all of those components together. So we have our carbon dioxide, and we have water, we have energy from the sunlight, and it is going to add those components together to create glucose. Glucose is then in turn used in cellular respiration, so we can 
create ATP and fuel all of the processes in our body. Same thing does hold true for plants, as plants too have mitochondria, and they will kind of kick up whenever we go into the light independent reaction and the plant is not taking in sunlight. So again, photosynthesis is an anabolic process, ana, ad, and then cellular respiration is that catabolic process, cat, rare, scratch things apart. So just like the mitochondria, chloroplasts are actually adapted for their role in cellular metabolism, and they also possess structural components of their endosymbiotic origin. So you've heard me say that twice now, endosymbiotic origin. But what exactly is it? So endo means inside of, and symbiotic or symbiosis refers to organisms living together. So the symbiotic theory or the endosymbiont theory states that ancestral eukaryotic cells evolved after ancestral prokaryotes ingested mitochondria and chloroplast-like protoprokaryotes. Now that word proto means before. So it's saying that they weren't quite prokaryotic cells, but that they were ingested by prokaryotic-like cells. And they formed a very close symbiotic relationship with them. So this also posits that other membrane organelles, such as the nucleus, were formed due to an infolding of that cellular membrane. So what about evidence that supports this theory of endosymbiosis? Well, mitochondria and chloroplasts, as well as the nucleus, all have two biolayer membranes surrounding them, as opposed to just one. So all of the other organelles are going to have just a single bilayer that surround them. If the mitochondria and chloroplast precursors were actually engulfed, they would have been taken in by a vesicle, which would be the origin of that second membrane. So again, they have two bilayer membranes. So evidence that supports endosymbiosis. So if a teacher, maybe gave you a claim evidence reasoning, and you had to provide evidence that supports the claim that mitochondria and chloroplasts arrived through the endosymbiont theory, you could use these points of evidence. So point number one, membranes. Some organelles have double membranes. We have the outer membrane, which could be vesicular in origin. So again, membranes, they have two bilayer membranes. Antibiotics. So both chloroplasts as well as mitochondria are susceptible to antibiotics. This indicates that both of those organelles may have bacterial origins because as you know, antibiotics are going to affect bacteria. So division, both mitochondria as well as chloroplasts reproduced by a fission-like process. DNA, so each of those different components, the cellular components, mitochondria and chloroplasts, actually has within it its own DNA. And it is very similar to prokaryotic DNA in that the fact that it is circular or plasmid-like. They also have ribosomes, and the ribosomes that they contain are of the 70S size which is identical to prokaryotic ribosomes. Well, I hope that was helpful, gave you a little bit of an insight into the structure and function of mitochondria as well as chloroplasts, and we also touched on the endosymbiosis theory. For more videos like this one, you can go to www.nerdlingscience.com. This is the Queen Nerdling signing off for today. Have a wonderful day.